Hey everybody, welcome to the Wooden Boat Show. Uh, this year, since we couldn't all gather together here on campus, we wanted to bring the Wooden Boat Show to you. So we've been trying to do all sorts of things online, everything from boat tours posted on YouTube and Facebook at 10 o'clock every morning, to live craft demonstrations at noon every day for a lunch and learn, and webinar presentations in the evenings. Um, so I hope you've been enjoying the Wooden Boat Show. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, one of the greatest things about working at the folk school here is the people that I get to work with. Um, such a talented group of people. We've got so many people with so many different skills. And today we get to join our program manager, Ben Byron. He is our resident knot head and amateur rigger. And he is going to talk to us today about some rope care and some rope whipping skills. So let's go check in on Ben and see what he's up to. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? I'm Ben, as Gio said, program manager at Dartmouth. I'm currently working on doing some ice splice work for North House. We have a, in these times of COVID, we kind of have to start blocking off some of the buildings because we still want people to look in. So we're planning on having doors open with a little bit of a barrier and, you know, a bunch of red tape saying caution just doesn't seem classy enough for us so we're making some uh kind of ice spliced little deals here as our barriers but one of the things i want to talk about is rope care and taking the end of care of the ends of your rope and one way we do that a classy way and kind of the traditional way or classic way of doing that is doing something here what we call a whipping which is a bunch of thread wrapped and wrapped around and then kind of bed and seizing off that end. Now I'll go and show you some examples of what people currently do out there and you know, have a better idea. Come on on, Jay. So, the ends of rope that you come across a lot now are either frayed like this, a bunch of cowtail on there with a big old big knot there, which, you know, it's kind of hard to reef that through a pulley or a block. So that works in a decorative sense, but you know, if you don't, even if you don't have an head knot, it just keeps on fraying and fraying and fraying and you're just losing tons and tons of rope. Other ways people do it is they uh, melt the ends of the rope like this, which works, but uh, you tend to get a really hard and sometimes sharp chunk of plastic on it. Also, we have the problem that this can suddenly crack and break and fray, and there's really nothing to stop us from that. And one of those examples of a broken one is this big line here. You can see here, it's kind of nasty, kind of ugly. It was melted the whole type, but it wasn't melted well and it has come apart and frayed. And part of this style of a uh, splice or a butane splice, as Brian Toss would call it, <laughs> um, is that it can fail suddenly and there's really nothing to stop it. And once you have like double bladed uh, line like this, the core is coming through, the, the end's coming through, and this rope is starting to lose its ability, to, it's in its full strength. Uh, other ways you'll see it is with the classical electrical tape splice, which works okay for things such as uh, three-ply uh, three or rope or twisted stuff. But over time, one thing, electrical tape, you can't get it tight enough around that. So you kind of have this loose and it'll kind of get forward and you can have the same thing where it's a decoying from the rope. But also over time, as these get wear and start chafing, one thing, electrical tape dries out and it starts falling off and then you know, all of a sudden you have a cowtail happening. And if you're using masking tape or anything oh, before it's like totally dried out, it's becoming this sticky mess that's just becoming nastier and just coming covered in dirt. Now, in an emergency situation, some people will put some larger line like paracord or whatever on it which is, works fine and that's great for emergency thing, but it gets pretty bulky pretty soon and that could also be something that has, you know, might have a hard time putting through a block or a pulley. So, what we are gonna look at and talk about a few different vari variations of it 
This is a classic way of doing end whippings. You can see just around and we have a few warming strokes on there. That's how palm and needle one and we'll go over that. But I'm going to show you some simpler, uh, quicker ways to go about doing that. So I think we'll grab, we grab these two big lines since it's a little hard to see on Facebook. So we'll use the biggest stuff we have. So I'll grab this braided line, I'll grab this twisted line. This twisted line also has some interesting packaging tape ends on it. <laughs> all, the, all the styles are done. All right. And before we get started on um, me sitting down here, I'll show you a little bit about the materials that you can use for whipping ends. Come on over here. So when you whip the ends, uh, I tend to use either something called sail twine, which is used, it's a wax line that's used for sewing sails. They come in different sizes. There's uh, number twos and threes and up to sevens. And there's also something called specifically whipping twine. This is an eight millimeter, and, but they come in the larger sizes. And your size of twine you're gonna wanna use depends on the size of the rope. A smaller rope, things other three quarters inch in diameter, you want to use something like sail twine or this whipping twine. Anything larger, three quarters and over, you'll want to use something kind of like this number 36 tar line or marlin. And that's what we'll use. We'll use this. Uh, you can get, actually, this is number 36. This is 18 and I have 12 over there. And also some really, really big stuff. This is like 96. This is all stuff you can get online. It's relatively cheap. Uh, if you want to go a more traditional line, length, you can also get hemp cordage or line. Uh, the big important thing with all of these is they have a wax or a tar. Uh, the wax is going to happen allow them to be a little bit slippier, slipperier, and tie a little bit easier and tie tighter. They're also a little bit more rot resistant because they are tarred. And all of these lines are very strong. So you don't want to necessarily use some cotton uh, twine or anything like that if you can easily pull it apart because I'm going to end up putting a lot of force on it to uh, tighten down as much as I possibly can. So you want a strong line. Hemp is very strong. These sailing twines and these are also very strong. They're a kind of a high strength polypropylene brand or they used to be linen line or something similar. And with the basic stuff, that's all you need. Uh, for the further stuff, like the palm and sail pond, you'll need some sail needles, which I have one here. This is a pretty big one. You'll need some sail needles for the big ones, or you might need also a sewing palm, which these are the hardest things to come by. You can get some cheap ones, but the cheap ones uh, don't work nearly as well. They just don't fit the hand that well and something like this, a little bit nicer fitting one, it's gonna cost you around 80 to to $100. So that's an investment, but you don't need this if you don't need to. Um, a needle and a pair of pliers will do the trick just as well. And I'll show you kind of the basic way we do it without as much many fancy tools as we need. So I think the first one, let's grab, get, start. Before we even get started going, if you have a problem like this and it's already falling apart, I'm going to try to bring that end milking the line a little bit. So now I've brought that double braid back in, the core and the braid are there. And a lot of this has already been compromised and really loose and not that tight. So it's kind of like just not bulky and around. It's not as dense as this part. If you wanted to feel that, Jake, feel kind of how it's a little bit more smushier here than mm -hmm. down here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I don't want to end whip right around here. There's just, there's not enough good room, but I do want to try to hold it off there. So I'm going to probably put the end whipping down here. But the first thing I want to show you is the go-to, the really quick is our first knot and is one of my favorite knots. It's called a constrictor knot. And if the bowline is the king of knots, constrictor is our queen. <laughs> and 
this is going to be hard and teaching knots is really hard so I'm going to tell you right now don't watch this video to like learn how to do them. There are a lot of great resources online about how to do all these knots so this will just be a quick overview but the constrictor knot if you know a bull and you want to know your next knot constrictor one is the, go, is the one to go to. The constrictor is similar to a clove hitch. Why don't you come around me Jake and show you. And I have a quick way of doing it and I have a slow way of doing it. I'll show you the slow way first and then I'll do the quick way. I'm going to wrap once around. The constrictor is what they would call a seizing knot. And one of the great things about the constrictor is that you can tighten it a lot and it won't come loose. This is one of those knots that once you get it down, it's hard. You can't untie it. Most knots, you try to tie the knot that's going to work best, but will hold through all the... What you need, it will do what you need to do and untie easily. Uh, constrictor is one of those ones that is like, this is a permanent knot. You're not going to go anywhere with it. I'm trying to get a little close view of that. That's tight. It, it's tight. And it's not going to come undone. So I have a secondary way. So that's a slow way of doing it. A quick way of doing that is I make a loop like that. I bend over. I made that, neck, that one a little bit loose, so I'll start a little bit larger. <laughs> and we're live. <laughs> we should probably talk about how I'm, I'm an amateur at all this. <laughs> I'm not a professional. There's professionals out there. But I think it's important to see amateurs do their work too. Kind of reduce the fear. All right. So that quick version didn't seem nearly as quick, but it's quick. And it's like <laughs> a basic muscle memory thing. So that's going to help hold that end. Now I don't have to worry about the core slipping back anymore. And we'll start with our first whipping. I'll grab some of this. This would be good enough. I tend to use a fathom of line as my generic thing, and a fathom is about your arm length. They kind of ended up calling it six feet. I have like a six three arm length, but traditionally a fathom was just your arm length. And it's really important that you work with the proportions of yourself because I'm going to take it in. All right. So with uh, first whipping, constrictor knot. Now we're going to go to the common whipping. So pretty quick, you start with, take your length of line, put a loop in it, put it down there, take your, and I'm going to wrap around, you see him pretty good, Jay? Mm hmm Okay. See, I'm wrapping towards the end of that loop. I have our end over here. Just wrapping up towards that loop. How far do you go? I'm put, also putting a lot, I'm holding it and pulling as hard as I can on it. And my thumb laying over top of it's gonna hold whatever friction's there. It doesn't need much, but I'm just kind of squeezing with my thumb and pulling with. You go to about, you try to make a square. So the length, of your whipping it should be about the same as the diameter of the rope itself if not a little bit longer that way you know you got enough on there and it looks kind of classy too a short whipping is not going to have enough hold as much holding power as a longer whipping and that's pretty square Looks square enough to you? Yeah, I like it. That seems good. Send that through. And then, I'm going to pull that loop back through there. And this is the importance of waxed line. 
and also a really strong line. I'm gonna pull this through and you can kind of see it moving through there. I'm gonna try to bring that little bulge just to the center. All right, it's good. So this whipping, it's pretty quick and easy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty quick and easy. Uh, it's gonna hold pretty well, but there is some things with it. Uh, it can, of all the whippings, this one, if it does start to chafe, it will start unraveling itself. But you can normally notice chafe, especially with any twisted or braided uh, whipping twine you might be using, a few strands coming loose, and you can come back and re whip it uh, anytime. And it's always important to like look over your rope ends a lot. Uh, at least once a year, if not more, to check for things like chafe happening so you don't end up with something like this. So that's a common whipping, pretty quick, uh, but if things start to fail, it can fail pretty quickly and you end up right there. So what's the next one? The next one would be our palm and needle style whipping, which is, pr is a little bit more advanced. And I'll, use, I'll start with our twisted line. Over here, we'll keep that tape on there, and fathom line. Which weight of line are you using there? This. It is an 18, no, 18 tar line, or also known as bank line. You can get all this stuff. There's a website, and not that I'm going to try to promote them, but it was a pretty good collection there. Um, rwropes.com, rnwropes. They have a section called rigging and sail making, and if you go there, they'll have all the essential stuff without the things that you really don't need. They have good palm, palms that have good sail needles. They have the right bank line or tar line. They have the sail twine. They have all the things you need. Snips available at the North House School store. That is correct. I'm going to use, this is my, all my sail needles. They come in different sizes. You pick the size of sail needle that fits your thread. I'm going to use this really big, bulky one that's actually like an upholstery embroidery needle. That should have a big enough hole on it. There we go. I normally don't do ropes this big, so I'm not set up to do really big stuff like this, as far as like having massive needles, but this will do just fine. You kind of just use what you need to make do. Yeah, with the, um, So I'm going to have that now, and then I'm going to poke it through the side, go through. Bring it about there, I'm going to poke it back through, and as I come through, so this is going to help set that beginning of that tail so it's not too loose in there, come back through, and I want to make sure that I'm going to come through right there in the lay. Now with all whippings, especially when you're doing twisted line like this, you want to go counter to the twist. So most rope have the Z twist or if you're looking at it, it's going up and to the right. What you want to do when you're whipping is go towards the end. So in this way, up and towards the left. Why do you do that? It's because when you pull on rope like this, it tends to squish down 
it like loses its diameter a little bit and twists in. And so when you go into the left, you're actually kind of forming a break and that means that the whipping won't come loose at all and won't slip further down, which is really important when you're doing the common whippings. On braided line, you don't have this problem, but on twist line, you do. So you wanna make sure that when you're doing any whippings on twisted line, that you're doing the whipping counter to the leg, which is always, for the most part, very rarely do you come across rope that's not laid up and to the right forever. But, let's see about that. So now I'm wrapping these double lined. Why is it that ropes end up being a Z twist? Um, it was a, I don't know the total history of the rope industry and why they chose Z twist over S twist, but um, if every manufacturer rope, similar to um, a lot of other industry standards, if every manufacturer was making like a S or a Z, you wouldn't be as easily able to splice those ropes together if one became short and they become longer. Mm -hmm. So you kind of tend to come across this. There was a decision made like everything's going to be Z twist. Everything's going to go this way. Yeah. All right. So, okay. We're about square there. Now where I came out and started going, I want to end in that same trench so there to there i'm gonna go there and i'm gonna put my needle in oh, i hope this is okay. so and then i'm gonna go back one so the line is going up and then back out previous one and then we're gonna worm so we call it down And go back up. Right here, I'm going to come back where I first did my first. There. Before we go back down, I'm going to get underneath. And I have this technique of like kind of putting in pulling back a little bit so I'm not pushing through the fibers and grabbing bits and parts of the line. This is kind of like I'm turning in and pulling back to get underneath. It's going to grab that end. This is what you gain fancy points with. <laughs> Pull that and then so now I've got that and I'm pulling it. Now it's brought that nice and tight with the rest and it's not just kind of hanging out there. We go in here. And now you're going in at the same spot you came out, down right there. And I'm gonna go forward here. Oh, gotta clean that up a little bit. Tom is asking for a bit of a close-up in between the steps. In between the steps? Let's take a look. So right there. Just about done. So now we've come through. And to finish it off, same motion. I'm going to go underneath this one. And we're going to put a half hitch in here. And if I can, I'll open up the lay a little bit. Take the needle through. That. This is the back end. So we have that half hitch here. Pull that through, and that embeds that half hitch inside there. I'm just going to do one. You could do two if you wanted to, but I'm just going to do one. All right, so you could snip it off, but I'm going to send it back in the lay and just kind of shoot it upwards further into the rope. Add a little bit of tail in there, pull that out. You can see it, and all that rope's up there, and you snip it off up there. 
if I was to cut it right down low at that where that half hitch was, there's that potential that that rope could slide out. Having this extra bit of tail in there, it's gonna help with that. Get a little twist, it'll suck that tail in. There you go. So Action there's a palm shot, glamour shot, palm and needle. That's beautiful. And I didn't use a palm. You can do that. Uh, this rope was kind of it's nice cotton line which isn't really something you'd use on any boat it's pre pretty much decorative so you're getting an easy spot but if it was really hard to push through and you don't have a palm push as much as you can when you have the sail needles they tend to have this uh look at that there's a storm here let's see if we can get a shot of this jerk my sail needles are triangular shaped Maybe we can catch the facets in there. So it's mm -hmm. a triangle. So, and they're pretty dang sharp, but the sides aren't sharp. So you should be able to push through even really dense line pretty easily. And if it, like, oh, that's actually pretty hard right there. But I can push through and just grab the pliers and pull it the rest of the way through and the rest of the line. So that's a trick. If you don't, like this is a specialized tool. If you're really, if you're on a boat and you're working with line, you probably should get this as just normal maintenance for anything. You should probably have sail needles too. Um, you know, and if you're in other industries besides boats, this is good stuff to have too. Uh, I've done work as in tree work, and I've done work climbing, and. You know, this is your traditional way of managing those. Or these are the classic ways. I wouldn't necessarily say traditional, but classic ways um, of dealing with this. And these, like, if this starts to chafe here and lose, these worming whippings are going to keep that together. Like, this isn't going to go anywhere. Now, as a backup, just do another one. And then even if this one does chafe, you'll have the second one there ready to go for you. Uh, the last thing we'll do is cut off this end. You don't want to do anything less than three eighths of an inch towards that. And if it's a small rope, you can use a knife. If it's a big thing, you can use a bigger knife. Or since we're at North House and we love axes, we use an axe on the block. Uh, I also learned that three eighths is about my uh, size of my actually pinky nail. So. Alright, there you go. And they tend to fluff out a little bit at the ends there, and if you are trying to reave them through blocks, it sometimes gets in the way. And I'll just take my snips and snip some of that off. Kind of taper it a little bit. It should be all right. That's that's one of my my snips are getting dull. It's time to get a new invest in a new pair. They're amazingly cheap, so that's hyper fancy. Okay, so <laughs> that's how you do it with twist line. But most of us aren't dealing with twisted line anymore. So how do you do that with braided line like this? I can't do I can't do the worming. Well, actually, you can. You can do those worming lines, and I'll show you that too. It's a little bit quicker, but it's the same process. Again, I'll use that. Time. 12.30. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any questions about what I'm doing so far? Or anything that's totally different? If you're lacking the proper you know, whipping materials, are there kind of common oh. 
household or hardware store materials that can be used for this? Yeah, so, um, I don't know if everybody heard that, but Joe asked, like, so say you don't have whipping twine or tar line or all these fancy things that have, what else can you use? Um, cotton string's not going to work the best, but, um, you know, I found, actually, decor some paracord. Where's that? Where's that line? There's some paracord somewhere around here. There was that line with orange paracord on it. Alex, oh, that one, just twist line with the paracord. Mm -hmm. Alex, can you cut off the paracord on that? So you can decor paracord. There's usually seven strands with inside a piece of paracord that you can decor and use as line, and they'll be pretty strong. Give your scissors. So that's one thing you can do if you have paracord on, you can decor that. Uh, th the mason line. The core lines? The core lines of paracord you can use. The mason line that you get out of a hardware store that for uh, kind of this marking off areas, that'll work. That stuff tends when you cut it, kind of like frill out, but that'll work in a pinch. You kind of have to melt that down, sadly. Cause that's one of the nice things about tarred and wax line is that they don't kind of cowtail right of the way. And some lines, if you cut them, they just kind of explode into a thousand hairs right off the bat without even having a chance. All right, so we're gonna do this braided line. Also, the tarp right the dog. Sweet. All right. Cut off a small bit here. Inside this piece of paracord, see the core, there's all these. You can pull one of these individual lines out. There you go. You got some nice line. You can pull out more if you need bigger pieces or whatever. So that's a useful trick if you have paracord with you or around you, which is most of us do somewhere. Um, the other thing is that all this rope is made of tiny yarns. So, you could pull some of this out if you wanted to. Here's my Obviously, you need to pull quite a bit, big section out of there. But you can, oh, it's got that, it's melted. All right, so you can also do it with just the rope itself and the smaller strands of that rope. So if you're a really tight pickle and you need to do that, I would say don't bother. If you're in that sort of situation where it's like, it's an emergency, I need to get this through a pulley block or my like wrap's not going to make it. I would say we just do a constrictor knot with it so you don't have to pull like a fathom of length out of your braided line. But that's, a, that's something you can also do. And yeah, just finding stuff around the house. Uh, with smaller line, like three quarter line, there is some strong like upholstery twines or whatever that you might find around for just like sewing buttons on a uh, button. Actually, yeah, button line is actually pretty good for putting buttons on shirts. It's usually a little bit thicker, denser stuff. You, gotta, you won't be able to get it as tight or pull as hard of it because it'll just break, but it, it works in due time. All right, so we're back to palm and needle whipping a braided line without a palm. So I'm gonna start here just as we did. Getting that through there. Oh yeah. You're trying to go right through the middle with it? I'm going right through the middle with it, so I'm gonna start it off this way. Bring the tails in. I'll go back through and I'll send the needle up just a little bit higher than when it did come through. With braided line, it doesn't really matter which way, if you go right or left. Uh, I'm going to go left because that's just, that's that's just what I do with everything, so I might as well just try to be consistent. And as long as you're consistent, you might still be wrong, but at least it'll look good. <laughs> as a jazz musician once said, who I think is the guitar player for Naked City, which, Joe, you might know them. <laughs> One of those John Zorn bands. Uh, yeah, I could have. Um, 
you know, you do you you play the wrong note once. Sounds like you missed me, messed up. You play the wrong note three times. People start to believe you're doing what you know what you're doing. So. All right, so about a square right there. And now I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna go through right at the same spot. And I'm gonna try to exit. Now this is one of those ones. A, I'm using a really blunt needle. To do something really hard. So. Send it through the center. Try to get it straight through. That's pretty good. I'm gonna pull in there. I'm gonna send it up. Let's get a close up. Yeah. So I went through here, shot through, came up, and now I'm just gonna go straight back and try to come out right there where we originally started. Oh, almost there. I think I could do that better. At least fake it. Oh. There we go. It's coming through right back there. I'll clean that up. Cleaning these up and kind of having them perfectly side by side as opposed to if they're twisting around is going to be one last spot for chafe. And I'm going to do the same thing as we did on the three strand. I'm going to hitch over the top of it, pull all together. There he is. So at this one, you're not making those diagonal like you did on the twisted rope. That's right, because there's nothing to really follow. It's the farthest one in. So then I'm going to go back in here. Follow along. Get all that twist in there. Do it one more time. This is safety. problem with this one is because since it's not a three you're not going to get an even number because I still want to do my half hitch and tuck it back into the main line of the rope I guess I could have started backwards too oh well we all learn <laughs> you get the idea <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna add that half inch in there like that and then I'm gonna tuck it in Send it further up. Hopefully, I'll be able to pull that hitch right inside the core. Yeah, there it is. One of the things with having a roping palm is you can twist around that large piece of leather and just pull on it. But if you don't have that, you can also do something called a marlin spike hitch. Alright, so that's in 
there. Finished up. Glamour that, shot. That half inch just pulled inside. And I'm just going to send it back up through so I can leave some tail inside. So if you watch a pro do this, it's kind of like, oh, this is not that good. If you watch me do it, and you're like, oh, anybody can do this. <laughs> Which is, uh, that's what we're trying to make you do. Anybody can do this. As long as you have some spare time in your hands, which a lot of us still do. All right, so there you go. That's a uh, palm whipping on braided the rope. We have where is it? Palm whipping on a stranded rope. We have the common whipping on the braided rope. We can also do common whippings on the stranded rope, just in case you don't have a lot of time. You don't have a palm. You don't have pliers. You don't have the needles. Do the common whipping, and then we have our constrictors on here. If it's, we need to get these things tied off in the flash. So Ben, one question that came in is how many times do you stab yourself? How sharp are those sail, uh, sail needles? You, uh, you quickly learn where to place your hands. I have, I've drawn a lot of blood. <laughs> Same thing with like spoon carvers. How many times did you cut yourself? Yeah, needles. Especially when you have so much pressure of your hand pushing through a rope and it's usually like it's not going through my finger It's always like catching the side of something You're like oh, I think I'm missing and like you just kind of when you're pressing in It's kind of adding it a little bit of an angle to it. So I've, I've stabbed myself enough <laughs> yeah. um, That's what I got I can go further down some other strength paths, but I think that's pretty good for us all. Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you yeah. so much, Ben. I appreciate the, the time and expertise. Yeah. You seem like a pro to me, you know, but yeah. who am I? Yeah. Um, it's good enough for yardists so far, so. <laughs> that's all it that matters. That, that boat stays in the water and gets people to and from shore very safely. So that's look what forward it's all to getting, about. Her, getting her back out in July. And Ben, thank you very much for your time. And thanks, everybody, for watching. And if you enjoyed this, we've got lots of other content. We've got uh, some great webinars coming up uh, tonight and tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, we've got David Thorson, uh, our featured presenter for Wooden Boat Show 2020. He'll be talking about um, things he's learned from sailing and exploring polar regions and being all over the world and climate change and things that he's experienced and witnessed through his travels. And uh, we'll have another Lunch and Learn tomorrow. And all of our content can be found at northhouse.org. So if you enjoyed this, please take a look there, and we will continue to keep that content uploaded. Thanks so much for joining us, and have a great day.